Now, I promised at the start of this presentation that I wasn't going to keep the discussion of race and culture in the philosophical and theoretical stratosphere, that I was going to bring it right down to everyday observable behaviors that we notice in ourselves and that we see in others. And I'd like to start with a discussion of names, proper names, your name, my name. If I were to go around the room and ask you for the story behind your name, chances are you'd have a story behind it. Maybe you were named after a favorite character in one of your parents' books, or the town where you were conceived, or whatever. But there's a story behind your name, and your name is important to you. And when someone mispronounces your name, which happens to me fairly frequently, you kind of wait for an opportune time. You do a little internal cringe, and then you wait for an opportune time to make the correction. I was appalled to learn that in some of our classrooms, nationally, you know, teachers have a lot to attend to, and, and they've got a very, very difficult job. And so one of the things that can happen, not always, is if a teacher comes across a student's name or a staff member comes across a student's name and it's very long or very difficult to pronounce, sometimes there's a temptation to just assign that student a Western name. Yeah. I can't quite make this out. This is going to be tough. I'm going to call you Jack, okay, sweetie? Or I know I'm going to have difficulty during the day recalling what your name is. So if you don't mind, you're going to be Susie, okay? And I caution people about that. I went to a presentation given by Bonnie Davis, who wrote a wonderful book, How to Teach Children Who Don't Look Like You. And she told the story of subbing in a classroom in inner city Los Angeles. And the young Hispanic boy in the front row who talked about how he loved his teacher so much. And at the end of the day, she said, well, why, you know, why do you love your teacher so much? And he responded by saying, because my name feels safe in her mouth. And I thought that was a very profound thing for a young student to have said. When you get a name, when there's a name that's difficult to pronounce and it happens, it's important to work with that student, work with the student's family. Is there a nickname that you're called at home? Is there a shortened version that I can try? I lived in Nairobi, Kenya for a number of years, and some of my Kenyan friends, professionals, teachers, lawyers, had difficulty pronouncing Daryl. It kind of came out like Dow, and it was frustrating. And they said, may we call you D? And I said, absolutely. So the whole time I lived in Nairobi, I was known as D. And now when I go to Fuddruckers and they ask for my name, I give them D so that they won't butcher um, my name. <laughs> Words and phrases. It's important, I think, to recognize that each of us, every single one of us, have certain words or phrases that set us off, that make our teeth grate. And we don't know that about one another because they're very individual to ourselves. For me, for example, and I think for many women baby boomers, being called a girl is something that can kind of set our teeth on edge. We grew up with Helen Reddy and the women's lib movement, and so to be called a girl. But what I'm noticing is that young 20 and 30-somethings in the workplace refer to each other sometimes as girl. So that kind of terminology is, is starting to get phased back into the workplace and isn't as insulting. Um, the term wheelchair bound is a term that sends me to Nut City. I did a lot of advocacy work, worked for individuals with disabilities, with individuals with disabilities. And what we often try to get across is that people who use wheelchairs are not bound to it, they're not tied to it. They're instruments of liberation. They allow for independence. So I was really distressed when 40 years after the Rehab Act of 1970, we're still referring to people who use wheelchairs as wheelchair bound. Another term that grates my teeth and sets me on edge is when people say they don't see color. Now, I understand what's meant by that phrase. It means that you treat everybody equally and, and you don't want race to be a factor in the way that you treat people. But say that, because saying that you don't see color, first of all, that's absolutely impossible. The eye is the first sense to take in information. And secondly, I want you to see my color. I want you to see my color. I want you to see the gray hair. I want you to see my height, because that is all part and parcel of who Daryl is. And as I said, you all probably have words or phrases that set you off. And you don't know it until somebody points it out. And when somebody points it out, there's a tendency to say, well, my goodness, what can I say now? And the point is that it's not everything that you say that's offensive. It's just occasionally you may come out with something that offends a particular person because of that person's experience. When I was in graduate school, I was bandying the term uh, low man on the totem pole. I, was using, I don't know why. I was just saying, oh, he's low man on the totem pole, so you don't have to worry about him. And a Native American student came up to me and said, you know, totems, Daryl, in my culture, are really something that's very meaningful. 
And so when you use that term, it kind of grates. And while I was a little embarrassed, I knew exactly what I was talking about. It was sort of like if I was talking to a group of Catholics and I said, well, count the rosary beads on that one, buddy. <laughs> you know, it's just disrespectful. It's flip and it's, it's not helpful. So think about words and phrases that you use that may uh, not set well with other folks. Pronunciation. I defy you to point out a person who comes from that part of the world who calls the countries Iraq and Iran. They don't. If you listen to people who come from that part of the world, they say Iraq or Iran or Persia even. Um, I had an opportunity to go to um, a meeting of AVID students, my very first day on my job as program manager of the College Success Program. And there was a young lady in the audience who talked about coming from her country, and this was her country, I'm gonna spell it and you write it down. S-A-M-O-A. And we all know that country, it's an island in the South Pacific, and we say it is Samoa. Samoa. She talked about country coming from the island of Samoa. And I said, wow, I'm 50 years old, and for the first time in my life, I'm hearing the name of that country the way it should be pronounced. So be aware of pronunciation. Foods. Like your name having meaning for you, we have certain foods that have particular meanings for us. And if I were to go around the room and ask you what your favorite food is or what your favorite comfort food is, chances are you could tell me, and mashed potatoes always comes up as a comfort <laughs> food. And so I'm distressed when I see or hear groups of students, groups of adults, looking at a plate of food, particularly because we have lots of international nights in our school system where families are encouraged to bring the foods from the countries that they come from. When I hear people pointing going, ew, What's that? Because doing that is not only disparaging the food, but it's disparaging the culture that the food comes from. I worked in the Office of Equity and Compliance for a number of years, and I can't tell you the number of times that allegations of discrimination started by disparaging comments about what's cooking in the microwave. And I would have to talk with the two employees and explain. Some cultures are very heavy in garlic. Some cultures have very heavy fish diets. Some cultures require that you pop popcorn in the afternoon and it burns and you have that lovely smell <laughs> wafting through the halls. So again, I encourage people to pay attention, particularly when you are engaging in activities where you're sharing foods from different cultures. Be aware of how you react, your facial expressions. World news and geography. I like to tell teachers that it's no longer important to just know the content area that you teach in. It's very, very important to understand uh, what's happening in the world and what's happening in world news so you know why the parents are there, why the students are there in your classroom, why you're getting colleagues from all over the world. You know, we're all being slammed together and being asked to work together because of war, because of technology, because of economic conditions. And if you don't understand that, then you really don't begin to understand the cultures that are all around you. Um, I tell people, I caution people um, not to guess people's nationalities. Um, uh, I have a family member who, who tends to do that fairly frequently, and I always cringe, because if you guess wrong, you may very well insult that person. I've told you already that my family comes from Trinidad, and one of the things that I can tell you about people from the Caribbean is people from the islands talk disparagingly about people from other islands. People from Trinidad talk about people from Jamaica, who talk about people from St. Kitts, who talk about people from St. Croix. It's just part of the culture. So be aware of that, and be aware of what's happening in, uh, in different parts of the world and in our news every day. We're gonna go to a break. And this time during the break, I'd like you to think about whether you can call to mind any of the examples that I shared with you. Um, have you ever come across an incident, uh, a cross-cultural incident that's been uncomfortable because of the person's name, because of pronunciation, because of words or phrases or foods or even world news and geography? The Hispanic population under 18 years of age grew by nearly 45%, and the Asian population under 18 years of age grew by more than 30%. Voices for America's Children. <laughs> 